Hello and good morning everybody! Welcome to my YouTube channel! Today we have an interesting narrated walk to visit one of the most significant Chinese temples in Penang. By that I mean the Guan Yu Ding or Temple of the Goddess of Mercy. I am creating this video because my brother happened to ask me about this temple a few days ago. So here we are at the Guan Yu Ding, but before I continue, let me first give you our location coordinates. You may key the coordinates into your GPS, Google Maps or Waze and be navigated right to the front of this temple. And when you visit it in person, you can turn on this video and have me as your virtual walking companion. The temple enshrines the Guan Yin or Goddess of Mercy, which was appropriated by Eastern religions for the Avalokitesvara. Guan Yin Ding is the vernacular name of this temple. It also has an official name pronounced in Pinay Hokkien as Gong Hok Kyong, and that name comes with a double meaning. In the literary equivalent of killing two birds with one stone, Gong Hok Kyong translates as Palace of Extensive Good Fortune, and simultaneously as Palace of the Cantonese and Hokkien. And that's the name you see in calligraphy above the entrance. It's a temple built of mutual funding from the Hokkien's and the Cantonese and is one of the oldest temples of its kind in the region. Those even older are few in numbers. Among them, the Vihara Dhamma Bhakti, also called the Kim Tek In Temple, built in Jakarta in 1650, and the Cheng Hun Teng Temple, built in Malacca in 1673. We are now in the first prayer hall, built in 1800. Though it might not be immediately apparent today, the temple was built on a hillock that once commanded a view straight down towards the sea. That view has since been obscured by taller buildings. The Hokkins and the Cantonese came together to build this temple because they needed a place of worship and the Bodhisattva Guan Yin was the popular choice, as she was to them the embodiment of compassion and protection. We just saw one of the granite dragon columns of the temple and here we have the temple drum. Devotees would write their petitions to be submitted to the Goddess of Mercy, who is known as Guan Im Hu On the walls are murals of the four heavenly kings, who are the symbolic guardians of Buddhist practitioners. Various calligraphic plaques adorn the lintels of hallways. Construction of the initial temple in 1800 was made possible through the contribution of 454 individuals and business entities who raised 3,803 Spanish dollars for the project. Donations came even from the Chinese capitan of Batavia and Malacca. The temple was modeled after Malacca's Cheng Hun Ting. It follows the Hokkien architectural style with its curving roof ridges topped with prancing dragons. When it was first completed, the Gong Hok Kyong was at the center of both the social and spiritual life of the local Chinese. It was here that circular affairs such as disputes were mediated and arbitrated. Originally of a single prayer hall, the temple added another in 1824 for the worship of Taoist saints. Also added is a central courtyard or air well that separates the two prayer halls. Here, I must confess that, not being a Taoist or a Buddhist, I am not that familiar with the minor deities of the Taoist and Buddhist pantheons. Who is this deity for example? Can anybody tell me? I can recognize major deities such as the Goddess of Mercy, the Tuapekong and the Quan Kong for example, but the rest I can't do it on sight. If you are familiar with this temple, do let me know which deity is installed where. Over on this side is a row of stelings with details of its founding and list of donors. While the principal deity of this temple is the Kuan Im, there is also an ancillary deity which is the Ma Cho or patron goddess of seafarers. Migrants, having been delivered safely across the choppy sea, would offer supplications of thanksgiving to her. I have come across suggestions that Ma Cho was the original principal deity and it was only at a later date that she was replaced by Quan Im. Whether or not that is true, I can't say for sure. It just shows that when we dive into historical research, 
there will be instances where we uncovered such disparities and I can only report based on what I have uncovered. And here's the temple bell. In most temples, whether a Buddhist or Taoist, you can expect to see a drum and a bell. And now we are leaving the main temple building to go to the annex and courtyard. Over here, we have a tiered structure which is the Joss paper burner. As with many other temples, the Gong Hok Kiong has been expanded successively over the past two centuries. And with each expansion, it grew sideways. What was once the exterior is now cloistered and forms part of the temple. And at the rear, which many people do not know of, there is even a garden. It's an oasis of greenery, almost a world of its own. And yet, beyond that door, is the street outside. This patch of greenery is something new to the temple which, through its long history, has seen its share of upheavals. Although this temple was the result of collaboration between the two main Chinese groups, in the subsequent decades since its founding, that social fabric would be torn by the struggle for economic advantage. The 19th century is a different time and space from our present time. It was a time when, for the majority who were in the working class, it takes all the effort just to survive. For the sake of self-preservation, each community has its own secret society, equipped with its own fighting men. There was the Gihin, a secret society initially dominated by the Cantonese, but by 1860 includes a sizable number of Hokkien's, Teochews, Hainanese, and even Hakas. Their chief opponent was the Haisan, which started out being mostly Cantonese and pro Gihin, but by 1854 has become exclusively Hakka and anti Gihin. These two groups were at odds with each other, and for a while, the temple was the referee. But the level of rivalry and animosity between them was so intense, it eventually led to 10 days of street fighting with the loss of many lives. It's an incident that we know today as the Penang Riots of 1867. That the Kong Hok Kiong Temple failed in its role to prevent that riot possibly puts an end to its function as the community tribunal. That role was eventually inherited by the Chinese Town Hall, established in 1886 to look after the secular affairs of the Penang Chinese, leaving the Kong Hok Kiong to focus on spiritual matters. In a way, it also sidelined the temple and diminished its influence over the community. On the other hand, freed from circular encumbrances, it was able to embark on temple building projects which it might otherwise be too distracted to undertake. The most ambitious was the one spearheaded by the new abbot Biao Lian, who on being appointed the resident priest, found Georgetown to be too noisy for him and decided to create a new monastery in the hills. He successfully canvassed five wealthy Penang Chinese benefactors to donate handsomely to his project. Construction of his temple commenced in 1890, sited above the village of Ayer Itam on a site called Crane Mountain, and in 1891, he unveiled the first of many pavilions of the Temple of Supreme Joy or Kek Loksi. A hundred and thirty years after it was founded, the Kek Loksi Temple has grown into a sprawling complex. It is the largest temple in Penang, possibly in Malaysia and even Southeast Asia. It dwarfs the Kong Hok Kiong many many times over, but without the Kong Hok Kiong, it would not have existed. We are now in the inner courtyard of the Kong Hok Kiong Temple. There are no worshippers here. You will find most of them in the prayer halls and in the altar courtyard. Over here, we find the administrative office and living quarters. In its early years, the management of Kong Hok Kiong comprised a board of trustees led alternatingly by a leader from the Hokkien or Cantonese community. 
After July 1887, this took the form of 10 trustees from the Hokkien community, nominated from the five big clans of Ngo Tai Se, namely Chia Kong Si, Tan Kong Si, Yo Kong Si, Lim Kong Si, and Ku Kong Si, and another 10 trustees from the Cantonese community, coming from the Guangdong and Ting Chiu Association. Earlier, I mentioned the clash between the Gihin and the Hai San. Such incidences often paint a somewhat distorted picture that these organizations are belligerent secret societies. On the one hand, it is true that they often conduct their activities confidentially and perform akin clandestine rituals. But on the other hand, they also had many recorded acts of benevolence and philanthropy including offering funds for the construction of hospitals and looking after the welfare of the downtrodden. Now we make our way out of the temple, past the first prayer hall. If you look into the sunshine, you will see a road going straight out from the temple. That road is China Street, and in the old days, you could stand in front of the Kong Hok Kiong Temple and view the sea from here. And as we emerge from the temple once again, we are coming to the conclusion of this narrated walk. Thank you for watching this video up to here. If you enjoy it, please give it a like, share it, subscribe to this channel and do hit the notification bell. And I look forward to bringing you another video very soon. Until we meet again, thanks for watching.